Hello and welcome to the Digital Craft Festival. Um, today I am being joined by makers from the Craft Festival at Bovary Tracy and Cheltenham. My name is Lynn hawking -Many. I am the Vice Chair of an organisation called Applied Arts Scotland. Um, we're a membership organisation led by makers for makers. Um, I am delighted to be joined this morning by five makers who are going to be talking together on the theme of translation. We've kind of chosen to interpret that very broadly, so um, the, you will hear different people talking about what it is that inspires their practice and how they work with that inspiration to translate it into um, the products that you would normally be able to pick up and touch at in-person festivals and today you're going to be seeing on screen with us. Hopefully it'll give you some interesting insights into all their work and their practice. You can find them all on the Digital Craft Festival website afterwards um, and we've got some contact details up on the screen if you want to get in touch with them. I'm sure they would all like that a lot. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Liz Fuxi, who's going to give you an introduction to herself. Hello, hi. Um, well, yeah, I'm Liz Cooksey. Um, I would normally class myself as a textile artist, but as my work's evolved a bit, um, I'm now um, saying mixed media. Um, I, um, I live in Manchester, uh, so um, quite a long way to come down to Bovey normally, but uh, it's always a lovely experience down there. Uh, so yeah, I live in Manchester, um, just quite close to the city centre, and um, I, um, I make uh, work um, that's inspired by nature. So um, in terms of the theme translation, um, I, I, I look at things usually when I'm on the walk with my dog. <laughs> so generally I have a dog walk every day. And as you can imagine in Manchester, it's not quite um, um, a mass of scenery and nature as you would in the countryside, but I try and gather as much inspiration as I can on every dog walk that I go to, uh, go on. And, um, and I use this to sort of inform uh, my ideas. And um, mainly what I'm about is working with um, wire and uh, metal and, um, and crochet. Um, I originally started working with crochet when I found my grandmother's, um, an old tin my grandmother had, um, and she had these tiny little crochet hooks in there. And I realized that, um, you know, after she died, I realized that she'd made all these amazing, beautiful things that I'd never really appreciated. And that sort of inspired me to learn how to crochet. Um, and I'm, I'm somebody who loves a process. Um, so I was determined to think about how I might use this technique um, in my work. And it's become, I'd say, the core of my work um, in that I use it in a whole variety of ways. Um, I produce framed work and freestanding pieces. Um, and um, in terms of inspiration, when I, when I think about nature, it's often the very small, minutiae of things that inspire me. It might be like a little um, clump of wild flowers that's growing out of the curbside. Or um, if I'm lucky enough to be on the beach, it might be um, little bits of um, lichen or barnacles that are clinging to a little pebble. Um, so it's, it's often it's those small tiny things that um, and the, the richness of colour and pattern and textures that um, sort of come in, into my work. Um, the wire um, has evolved um, over quite a few years and I'd say that um, it, co it creates the framework of, my, of, of the work. I use that sort of structurally and then I embellish it and I embellish it using metal and the thread of crochet and uh, sometimes paper. So whole, that's why in a way now I'm thinking more of a mixed media person rather than a textile person, even though I did do embroidery as a degree and uh, that feels like the core of me really. I still think of myself as an embroiderer. Um, but um, so just to show you just what I'm talking about, it's quite hard to probably, and if, if you don't know my work, I'm just gonna show you a small little example. This is um, a tiny, um, it's a wire. I keep the forms quite simple and I use a circle quite a lot to sort of uh, evoke seed heads and just natural forms um, that I see around. And then in that, you can just sort of see it's being crocheted with inside it. Um, and 
often I use more complex sort of wire structures and to bring in and introduce colour, um, each little element is crocheted. And if you could see my studio, this, this display here behind me is my mock bubby display. Um, and if I was to move the camera, you'd see the chaos <laughs> is behind the scenes. And it's, it's full of jars and jars of, of wire. So lots of um, sort of like collections of wire that I use and make as call my elements. And I bring these elements together to create sort of either framed pieces or sort of almost like little mini um, collections that, as you can see, they tremble and quiver <laughs> as they get moved. Um, and I suppose I, in my head as I'm making them, I think of them as almost like little mini places, little landscapes, small worlds. Um, and often I will introduce um, maybe a bird or a fox or a hare occasionally just to maybe bring out a narrative um, in the work. Um, as well as, as doing these framed standing sort of crochet pieces, the other thing I really love doing, which again is a sort of a translation of coming across small things within the natural world, um, I call them sort of collections. And um, uh, again, it's probably hard for you to see, but um, this is one here. And it'd be like little things that, again, you know, when you're walking, particularly um, if you've got a dog, you'll stop and pick something up that's like a, maybe a small pebble or um, a dry little seed head or something that will capture you. And it's all those tiny little things that um, really, something about them when you bring them back and you see them in a clean, sort of um, out of their context, out of their nature, um, their natural habitat, and you see them on a clean white sheet of paper and they become like treasures. And I suppose that's what I particularly like in making these sort of collections. And they will be uh, collections of uh, some things that uh, I've actually physically brought back and used, like little tiny pebbles, and others that I have handmade. So little bits of wire that I've shaped, little metal bits that I've hand cut and um, adorned to the wire, little bits of crochet, um, printed, feathers that I've printed onto paper and then cut out. So a whole sort of eclectic mix of different materials and um, techniques. Um, even little beetles get in there. I don't know if you can see the little beetle there. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you another one that has, um, has another little round one. There's a little ladybird there. So again, the beetles will be made out of metal embossed and then um, all put into a small sort of little, again, min in a way, my little, like a mini world. Um, uh, the other thing that, <laughs> that I do in, um, as well as um, sort of bringing these small handmade individual items together as, as what I would call a collections and treasures, um, I also incorporate quite a lot of embroidery as well. I, as you can see, I'm sort of, I jump around doing lots of different processes and techniques. Um, and in terms of translating the, that natural world, I also just use embroidery. Um, so in that mini circle, that little mini landscape, um, all that sort of hand stitch with lots of French knots, um, wrapped fabric with wire, printed papers, um, and then again incorporated to create a sort of a small world. Um, in terms of um, things that, um, you know, it, the natural world inspires me, but also just the, the sort of materials, things that I come across that I often think about, um, you know, what they can do. So like wire, you know, if you bend it, shape it, what you can do with that. When you crochet with a very tiny hook, what, what, what how does crochet change from something that could be, um, you know, like a flat circle to something that becomes like a little three-dimensional, um, you know, like an exploration. Um, I love the fact that materials can be um, evolved and changed just through experimentation. And I do a lot of just exploring, experimenting. I've done a whole series of pieces, finding, working with old books and, um, and just loving the um, edges of old books. Um, so you imagine when you see all the pages all squashed together and you get all those lovely lines. Um, and this was an old book that I recycled 
and it became again very nature inspired um, so part of the book is some of the edges of the gold of those lovely uh, pages and then little bits of, of the cover of the book that then has become again part of a collection and a little moth has got in there a uh, handmade moth from some of the pages that I've um, from the book and um, again some wire and sort of textile qualities and metal work so I am a real sort of um, mixture of techniques uh, processes materials resources but what I'd say brings it all together is that sort of um, love and um, pleasure of the natural world that's um, that's just within my world of Manchester walking the dog whether it's a wet winter day or a lovely spring summer day. Yeah. So that, that's me really. <laughs> that was great, Liz. Thanks very much. I really oh. love the idea that you take these things that maybe we kind of overlook in our day to day and turn them into these small treasures. Yes. And um, yeah. you kind of uh, give them, give them life beyond what they had. Um, but also kind of give people an opportunity to engage with these, small worlds that you create and actually the world around about them in a different way. Yeah, oh well, I know when, I, when I'm actually talking to people in the flesh at Bubby, um, I often a bit more coherent, but, um, but also the things that people really do take pleasure in is the natural world. And when they, they engage in my work, it's those things that trigger um, the interest in it. And also a lot of people, um, when they look at the work, they are quite intrigued by the techniques of like, oh, how did you do that? And oh, is that crochet? Because, it, you know, it's quite hard to tell unless you're there really scrutinising it and looking close up. Yeah, fantastic. Does anyone want to ask Liz anything just now before we move on to the next maker? Um, so are all your pieces that you create, are they all different? Are they all like individual pieces or do you try and replicate? Uh, yeah they they tend to be it's very difficult to replicate the same thing they are t they are all sort of unique there are themes that i sort of so i will do like a collection of pieces like this and there might be four or five in in this series but each one will have a different uh, quality of color and content but they'll be within that sort of theme uh, but no, they are all very, yeah, very unique. So if somebody likes something, it's already gone and they say, oh, could you make me one? I think, no, I can't. <laughs> <It's gone. laughs> Got to catch it while you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Well, without further ado, let's move on to our next maker, who is Alex Aldi. Yeah. So hello, I'm Alex. Um, I'm a ceramic and surface pattern designer and I'm based uh, in a place called Middleport Pottery in Socon Trent. Um, it's beautiful old Victorian pottery, uh, which is home to about six individual uh, open studio and workshops. And it's also where the TV series, Great Pottery Throwdown is filmed. So it's a really great place to be based. Um, I'm currently sat in my studio area. So this is sort of my shop where Middleport's vis visitors can come in and see and buy my work and my workshop is um, just off here as well so they can come and watch me make my pieces as well. Um, most of my products that I make are displayed behind me um, so it's uh, predominantly decorative ceramic homewares um, uh, which feature quite detailed intricate surface pattern designs which are either printed or um, like etched onto my pieces. Um, so the inspiration behind all my designs and my pieces um, come from quite traditional and heritage patterns. Um, I love looking through different like old pattern books. Uh, I love the William Morris style, so traditional wallpapers, uh, wall hangings. Um, and I've got I've kind of got two pattern ranges um, within my work, which sits together quite nicely along. Side each other. So I've got an, um, an architectural range which is based on English architecture and buildings. So I'll show you an example of that. It's one of my architectural prints on this one, the hanging plant pots I do. So I, it's based on, I love kind of like the really ornate and intricate details you find on um, old buildings. So I had a book based on um, some of the original drawings of St Pancras Station in London. 
So there's elements um, of that on there. So some of the window details, the lovely arch, uh, the arches in there. There's a um, cross section of a window from the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. Um, so I kind of hand draw elements and draw some of the really precise um, elements on Illustrator on the computer uh, to create my designs. Um, so I've, I've kind of got different compositions of these architectural styles, um, which I display on a range of different pieces. Um, and then my other print design, um, Pattern Way, it's um, kind of call it my fusion collection. Um, so again, this is based on um, all traditional styles and patterns, um, but it's basically a fusion of um, Victorian floor tile patterns. So I don't know if you can see there. So I love um, in old Victorian houses when they keep the original floor tiles as you walk in. Um, I had a book on all the different patterns of the different tiles. Um, so again, I kind of picked out some of the really intricate details that caught my eye of those and I've almost like recreated them and redrawn elements of those. Um, and this these print designs are mixed with um, like traditional floral motifs taken from, uh, again, from old pattern books with uh, traditional wallpaper designs. I had um, a pattern book uh, from the V&A, which was based on lots of um, different wall hangings and wall coverings. So I've kind of redrawn some of like the interesting floral motifs from those and created different compositions um, with lots of different patterns to kind of create my own style and make it um, slightly more contemporary. Um, and then the kind of the different patterns I do all sort of sit together um, with different collections, really. Um, you probably notice as well, I, I've got quite a limited color palette. So I just um, stick to blues and grays because my designs are quite busy and quite detailed and quite intricate, um, I didn't want to overdo it with colour and this colour scheme just works within with my designs. It's kind of what I'm known for. And um, so it's sort of my signature um, style really. Um, and then another part of my um, explor exploration with how I create my different surface designs is um, I play around a lot with creating surface textures. Um, through etching and creating like relief and emb and embossment on my pieces. So I've got um, so create tea lights, a range of different sizes of tea lights. It's a small one I do. If I get right close up, you might be able to see there's like etch texture within that. Um, so this is created through a process called slip casting. And I explored a lot with um etching the texture within onto the mold, which I then took a plaster mold of. Um, and when I slip cast that piece, it picks up that texture. And then it's some of my printed design kind of next to that. Um, again, it's all about playing with different, playing around with different compositions and creating like contrast to my pieces and having different elements going all the way around my pieces. So you can kind of display it at different angles. Um, and then I also etch into, so I use a laser cutter to etch in, to create those textures. I also etch on flat surfaces where I'm able to roll clay over the top. I don't know if you can see, there's like embossed raised relief texture there. And then you've got it combined with the print. Um, so this is made through a process of hand building. So it's much more organic form and looks kind of a little bit more sort of, unique and handmade um, against a kind of more precise slip casted piece. Um, that's what I kind of incorporate into a lot of my pieces. Um, and then I'll kind of just talk through about all the different kind of pieces I make really. So I do, you've got all the hanging planter parts which come in different designs and pattern ways, um, which are all listed on my website. Um, I do a range of different tea lights. So I do a slightly bigger one, um, which you can kind of see the larger area of etch. So that's some of the tile patterns that are etched in and then some of the floral motif, printed floral motifs. 
Um, I'll briefly talk about how I get a, a question I'm asked a lot at, uh, when I do like different shows is how I actually get the pattern onto my pieces. Um, so obviously it's a, they're all either hand drawn or drawn on the computer. So all my hand drawings are scanned in and then um, my computerized drawings are brought together on a program called Photoshop. Um, and that's where I explore a lot with different compositions for different pieces. Um, so we design them on, so that's an A3 sheet. This is a transfer, um, ceramic transfer print. Um, and I get these done locally by a specialist ceramic printer. Um, so these are different layouts for, I do um, printed bone china mugs as well. So that top strip there, that's one of the designs for one of my mugs. So that basically you cut that out and you soak it in water. Um, and it kind of, the best way of explaining it, it's like the temporary tattoos you get when you're little and you like you soak it in water and it slides off as a film. And um, this is just the backing it's on. So once it's, you slide, slidden the pattern off, you wrap it around the piece you're applying it to. Um, and then it's then fired on at lower temperature and that sets the print onto the ceramic piece. Um, and it's just a really um, quick process of replicating it. So, because a lot of people ask if it's hand drawn or hand painted onto the ceramic and it would take far too long with, because they are quite detailed prints and patterns. Um, so it's a process that allows you to kind of get really detailed designs onto pottery and um, without it taking too long. Um, so some of the other pieces I make, um, you can probably see a couple behind me, I do like hanging wall uh, planter pockets. Um, so these are made from, all of my work is um, producing high quality porcelain. Um, so this is made for a process called hand building. So I roll a flat piece of porcelain out and you probably can't see it on here, but it's got some of the embossed textures, the relief. So I roll it onto an area of um, etch pattern to pick up the relief um, and then form this pocket. It's fired and then I apply the individual prints on there. They come in two different sizes. Um, let me see, try and get them straight. So there's a slightly larger one and then a smaller one. And they come in the different pattern ways as well. I do it in the gray architecture. And they're also watertight. So you can put a little drop of water in the bottom of them and display um, flat, like different flower stems. You always have that spare stem from a bunch of flowers, which they're good for, or uh, dried lavender works really well in them. Uh, these are probably the most popular thing I do. Um, and yeah, there's different designs and they're all listed on my website as well. Um, I do, so I do a range of different tea lights. I also do plant, these work as a tea light and a planter pot. Um, I use a type of porcelain that's really translucent. So when you've got um, a little tea light candle in there, it really uh, accentuates the print details and particularly the ones that have got that etch texture, it really lights that up when you've got a little candle in there. Um, and again, they come in the architecture patterns or the more floral ones um, and they all kind of work together. Um, I also do a range of different like one-off bespoke pieces, which um, I don't normally sell online, but there will be some available on my website during um, the Digital Craft Festival weekends. Um, so I do uh, etched vases. They come in two different sizes. Um, I don't know if you can see sort of the etched detail quite closely on there. So it's kind of um, a combination of uh, the etched area with like the printed transfers and I create these are all completely one off so I just decide when the piece is in front of me I um, cut out all my printed transfer patterns and just have a play around with what fits where uh, I really enjoy doing these just so they're not just something that I don't create the same of if that makes sense so there's that size and there's a slightly smaller one all the sizes will be listed on my website so you can get a better idea and they're finished off these as well are finished off of like a luster platinum detail as well. I don't know if the light catches it, but just kind of finishes it off nicely. Um, 
I do these sort of like narrow stem vases as well. Um, these come in a couple of different patterns with the gray architecture as well. And um, they're just quite nice for just like quite tall individual stems, flower stems. And then I also um, create like frame tile pieces. Um, these are all one-offs as well. Uh, this is one featuring some of my architectural designs. And um, so there's, probably can't see it on here, but there's areas of um, relief embossment patterns mixed with some of my printed designs. Um, and this is like mounted and framed. This is how it comes. Um, again, these are all completely unique. So I make these up as I go along. And these always are quite popular when I bring them down to Bobby Tracy with me. Um, got a few different sizes of these. I've got a slightly larger one here. Um, again, lots of areas of the relief um, and then the prints over the top. Um, I do, yeah, I do love making these. Probably my favorite. And then a slightly different one of just one tile um, where I started playing around more with different backgrounds like a bit of like marble work with different colored stains and slips and then um again over the top with like some of my printed tile designs um and then i also do sort of like smaller um frame pieces more like giftable items uh, i do these as decorations as well um just like little porcelain a few different shapes and designs um which feature all my different printed designs on there as well um, and then, yeah, I do printed mugs as well, fine bone china mugs, which always make a good cookie. <laughs> um, and a big part of, important part of my work is, uh, so it's got my back stamp on, which um, has Soak on Trent on the bottom, which, you know, best, best place to be to make ceramics. So I think it's really important to put that on all my pieces as well. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Alex. The, uh, the, the kind of architectural plan detail of your work is just absolutely stunning. And it's just interesting to think how actually the kind of the process that you're working with enables you to have that detail that, you know, kind of people who create ceramics in different ways wouldn't be able to get that level of detail transferred onto the, or as you say, hand painted onto the surface. Um, it's just absolutely stunning and really nice to be able to kind of make that connection to particular places as well. You know, the, you talked about St Pancras, so that kind of way that people can connect back to the place where you took your inspiration from. A lot of people recognise, because I don't kind of obviously translate them onto my pieces, but people say, oh, right, that's really familiar. So I kind of want it in a, them to be familiar without it being too obvious. And when I say where it is, they kind of can't really connect with it then, which is lovely. Absolutely, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Alex before we move on? What's your best selling range, Alex? Um, probably the, the hanging plants of pots and mm -hmm. these pockets all go, always go down well as well. Um, so yeah, I think hanging plants is quite a big thing at the moment, plants. Yeah, plants. they are. Have you, have you thought of incorporating any uh, macrame or anything like that with the hanging part? Yeah, okay, I know because that's a really big thing at the moment. So mm. I, I have experimented with it a little bit. So all of my, um, the pots, they all come ready strong and they've got like a little bit of detail at the top. But I kind of wanted to keep them quite simple so it mm. doesn't take away from like the design on the pot itself, but is that something that I'm definitely exploring a little bit more with. Um, love to do a, a macrame workshop maybe. I'm sure somebody in the room will be able to help with that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, thanks very much, Alex. So moving on to our, our next maker in the series today, who is Mizuki Takahashi. Take it away, Mizuki. Hi, um, hi, I'm a jeweler and an amela, um, originally from Japan, and I live in I live and work in Worcester. I create my jewelry with um, silver or like a um, enameling on copper uh, using liquid enamel, which is um, set on the oxidized silver fastenings. 
And thinking of our theme uh, translation in my making, I feel uh, two processes refers uh, well, especially to describe the word. And one is the role of um, playing with paper during my uh, design stage. And the another one is my initial mark making drawings on sketchbooks. Um, I feel sometimes getting ideas uh, for new design is difficult to start from scratch, but I just feel very comfortable um, using paper uh, to cut, draw or fold, or like repeat some shapes uh, to create I could get ideas and then um, this process uh, starts or triggers some inspirations uh, to and brings me some ideas and I also do enjoy experimenting with uh, simple mark makings, uh, drawings on sketchbooks and enamel surface. Um, uh, mark making is a simple practice of lines, dots, patterns and textures. These marks are collected from my random drawings, uh, brush stroke marks and photographs or marks I found in daily life. And I found placing um, another sheet of paper with like a, these blank cut out shapes over these drawings really helps me to um, like uh, get lots of possibilities. It's like a small windows for me um, to find like um, different views and different design ideas. And then to make these mark making drawings onto enameled surface, I use a uh, scraffito and enameling paint uh, techniques. Um, scraffito is a scratching of the final layer of the enamel uh, um, to reveal the color underneath. So these two are made with scraffito technique. I use the black enamel underneath and fire it and I, I apply the white one afterwards. Then before firing, I scratch the um, white surface to reveal the black underneath. And after firing, it just uh, marries together. And then um, I use different size of like needle point tools, like like feather or these like uh, on the sticks and like small needles to scratch the surface. But um, it's really good, need really good concentration and controls and replicating these like a sketchbook drawing so marks onto enamel surface has a like a slight transition. I find um, then though I quite like the those slight transition and sometimes like accidental um, like strokes of line makes quite interesting marks, which I sometimes try to keep uh, it as a result. And uh, my silver correction, um, these ones, uh, strongly referenced uh, from my idea development with paper. I really like to show the delicateness of uh, the materiality, the beautiful curves of um, like, uh, these are my paper samples. I just like the beautiful curves of the paper and like, uh, um, nice edges of the paper and again like another beautiful carbs of the paper. I just um, I feel like using silver sheets uh, really works well to express and translate these ideas. So, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mizuki. I've really loved seeing how you kind of start from paper and then work your way into silver. I think it's, you know, it's um, as somebody not familiar with that technique, I expect that silver is quite expensive. So it's not like you want to be doing your experimentation phase immediately with the silver. It's great that you're able to kind of have that 
point in the, in the middle where you can play with paper, but actually that paper itself influences what your final silver product is, which is fascinating. Thank you. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask Mizuki any questions just now before we move on? I, I was thinking you'd ever, <laughs> you'd ever thought of, I love the mark making um, that you do um, and, and, the, and the sort of patterns and textures it creates. Have you ever thought of actually just using that to, as, as a, you know, to frame and to become part of your display? Um, mark makings that just are so beautiful. Oh, thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, I haven't really um, sold like uh, to put in frame like you, but maybe I should um, start putting into frames or something. It's really nice to see the sort of translation when you see yeah. that you can sort of see where it's all coming from. It's it's sort of yeah, it's, it works well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And do you find Alan, you're influenced by your Japanese culture as well? Um, I think I'm naturally, I just played a lot with like a paper, of course, when I was yeah. my childhood. But I was, I was like a try not to sort of show off too much, like sort of Japanese ness. But I think naturally comes out, uh, and I feel very comfortable working with paper. Mm -hmm. I feel it's very helpful material to the ideas. Your your designs are beautiful. Oh, thank you. I mean, I think we put, we might come back to this at the end, but we've kind of already heard about kind of heritage and identity as themes already. With Des talking about the work and um, kind of the inspiration from our grandmother's crochet, and Alex the kind of the heritage of Stoke pottery, and then the Mizuki perhaps kind of bringing in those Japanese paper influences as well. So now um, I'm intrigued to see whether uh, Laura and Carolyn pick up that baton and run with it or not. I'm <laughs> kind of perhaps preempting some of the conversations at the end, but hopefully not. Anyway, on that note, thank you very much again, Mizuki. And let's move on to Laura Crossland. Hello. Um, so I'm a potter. And I live in St Ives in Cornwall and I've got a studio in town at a place called the Jail Yard Studios which was originally the town's jail yard. So it's quite an old building um, and I did a degree at university in ceramics first and then came to St Ives after the degree to work at the Leach Pottery. So I did two years at the Leach Pottery which was kind of an apprenticeship but kind of I could already throw a bit, but it was more kind of pushing to be able to actually make enough work to make money from it, which I couldn't do after the degree. So I kind of came to the Leech Pottery um, through a charity called Adopt a Potter that helped to fund apprenticeship, which is a really good organisation. So I moved down to St Ives and spent a lot of time making tableware because the leech pottery do a kind of standard wear of mugs and plates and bowls, which kind of pushed me into designing my own range of tableware, which I've got some of here. So I've got a mug. Um, and this, we spent a lot of time kind of making the same shape. So I've got a range of pieces where I make the same shape of mug. So all my mugs are the same, and then I've got different glaze combinations that I put on them. So kind of production pottery is the, the focus of the learning at the leech. And then I've got pieces like this, so I do tankards that hold a pint. And then bowls. And I do lots of layers of glaze as well. So each, each of these pieces has got two glazes. So you can see um, this one and this one of the same glaze. But where I do the layers of thickness slightly different, the colour changes quite a lot. So that can really make them look quite different. So even though they're pretty much the same, each one comes out different and you don't really know until they come out of the kiln, which is good and bad. Um, and then I also have a range of one-off pieces, which you can see here, where I do a lot of carving. So all these designs are carved by hand, which takes a long time. 
So I'm going to show you how I translate the designs from the design ideas onto the pieces for these ones. First of all, I start off looking at geometric patterns, which you don't realise, but they're actually everywhere in the world. So kind of the treads on the bottom of your shoes and grates outside and bricks and everywhere you look, there's patterns. And I seem to notice those. <laughs> so I have a sketchbook where I draw loads of patterns. So, all the different patterns. So I draw out the patterns first, and then I think about how that might translate onto a piece. Because obviously that's quite a flat piece of paper, so it's nice and easy, but my pots are quite curvy. I've got to think about how it might translate onto a piece. So then I'll draw a piece. This is one of my tea bowls. And think how that's going to then work on the actual piece. And then when it comes to the actual pieces, I draw a grid on the pot. So I've got a drawing here. So I actually draw these lines on the pot. And then I can see where I'm going to draw one of my triangles or hexagons or whatever it's going to be. So that acts as a guide on the piece. And then I've got a pot here that I've carved. So you can see I draw out the design with a fine needle tool. And then you can see these ones are raised here because I carve around the shapes so that the design is actually raised from the piece. I spend a long time carving the shapes and then inside the shapes I do the line detail with a needle tool. Mm -hmm. and I, sit, I have a, a piece of foam in my studio so I lay the piece on its side so I can just sit and, and work on the piece for a long time. <laughs> I've got different designs, I've got the triangles I showed you here. And then I do hexagons. And then I do bigger pieces as well. Um, so it goes kind of from the tea bowls to some vases. That's a little vase that I do. And again, you can see all the different glazes. So once I've fired the piece, you bisque fire it first and then glaze it and then fire it again. So after I've bisque fired the piece, I have to glaze. I do the inside first and then I glaze the whole piece in a glaze that's got lots of iron in and then I sponge it off the carving so the iron stays in the lines. As you can see on this one, the lines actually go into the piece. So the lines are 3D and I don't want to just lose that with my glazing and just cover it. So I make sure I highlight the lines with the iron in the glaze. And then I put a green translucent glaze on top of that, which is really runny. So you can see it kind of runs down and blends with the glaze at the bottom. So I like to kind of have that contrast of a very controlled design at the top and then just see what happens with the glaze. And then I do bigger vases like this one. You can see the detail on this one. And you can see on this one as well how, because the piece gets wider, the design has to get wider. So I have to really think about the grid and the shapes on these ones. Whereas the straight ones are a little bit easier for that because it just stays the same size. And then I do very large ones. Mm -hmm. So these ones take a few days just doing the carving on these ones. But I think that's the bit I enjoy the most doing the carving, just sat for hours, just <laughs> carving away and I put a film on and just sit and do that. Um, and then I also do uh, a range that's a little bit more art deco, which has kind of just started to creep in recently. Um, you can see that one. And I do a few floral designs that are kind of Art Nouveau using flowers actually in patterns. They've just started to kind of come in really. And they fit in nicely with the colour scheme, I think. So I have a range of three different glazes. Um, so I've got this blue one. And this blue one. And then the brown one. And then the green as well. So I've got four. And I use the same glazes on the tableware and the carved pieces because when I do shows, 
obviously they've got to all sit together nicely and kind of make a display so they have to relate to each other in some way um i think that's everything really and also i mix up all my glazes in my studio so i kind of i've developed these slowly because i i need them to have certain qualities like they need to not be too runny but i want them to be quite fluid so these are all glazes that i've developed and mixed up Thanks very much, Laura. You're really kind of giving us a good sense of the length of time it takes to create some of these um, handmade objects. And I think as well, the other thing for me is it's not just about the time it takes you to go from the kind of uh, throwing a pot to having a, you know, starting with a lump of clay to having a finished pot, but it's actually all of that time and expertise that's gone into the design phase of it as well. You know, you mentioned the fact that you've kind of graduated, so you've studied for three or four years, but then you've also gone on to kind of more advanced training and all of that is brought to bear yeah. on these beautiful objects that you, not just that you create, but that everyone in this room makes. And actually when somebody is buying your work, they're yeah. buying yeah. that, you know, those skills and expertise as much yeah. as the time it's taken to create the objects. I think a lot of people don't kind of realise the, the length of time spent learning to throw as well. I teach on the on the throwing course at the Leech Pottery and people kind of come on the first day and think, oh, I'd like to be able to make a jug. But it takes kind of 10 years to be able to add <laughs> <laughs> a shape and then make a shape. So it's a very long process and it looks easy when you can do it because you've made hundreds and hundreds of them. So... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and that's true, whatever the discipline is that you're working in as well, that um, that kind of one object that sits on a, on a stand, a trade show is, you know, kind of years, of, years in the making. Yeah. Um, whichever way you want to think about it. Bab, does anyone want to ask Laura any questions before we move on? Uh, Laura, um, which, which process um, is your favorite? process in your um I think the, the carving is my favorite part of the process just sat because I kind of the throwing you really have to be thinking about it but when I get to the carving I kind of just I can just zone out and just sit and do those for hours so I like that best and I like the glazing the least because that's where it can go wrong <laughs> you start to rely on the kiln gods <laughs> Yeah, and they don't always go well. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, did you want to ask something? Yeah, sorry. Is all the carving done like three by three hands, or do you use like a guide? Uh, it's all freehand, really. I plan a, a guide. I have a guide in that I just do. I divide the pot in half with lines, and then quarters, and then eight. But then the shapes are all drawn by hand, and then I sit and and carve them by hand. It's quite ridiculous, really. <laughs> But yeah, I like that bit. I also like the fact that you're um, relying on some maths to create these objects as well. <laughs> it's not it's not all artwork in here. There's maths and science <laughs> and, and, and that underpins all of it as well. Yeah, and again, a, not just your work, Laura, but um, everyone's practice as well. It's, use, it's useful for any younger viewers watching this to think that um, that math that they might sit and endure will come in useful for them in ways that they might not expect. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, on that note, we can move on to our, our final maker of this session, Carolyn Ballard, who is actually here not just in her own right, but also <laughs> representing some. Um, members of the Creative Southwest group. So Carolyn, take it away. Okay, well hello everybody. Um, we're a creative partnership and support network um, of emerging and established textile artists and designer makers and we have 20 members across the Southwest ranging from Cornwall through to uh, through Devon and also Somerset and we also have one member in Holland as well who came over to see us and uh, joined our group. Um, I organise and run a professional development programme of textile workshops to extend our practice with international and nationally recognised tutors. 
such as Jeanette Appleton, who's our patron, and uh, Kaz Holmes, Valerie Wartell, Jill Denton, Lizzie Helton, uh, Yoki Van Zindren, um, and at least three of those last members are, are members as well of Creative Southwest. Um, our workshop programme has been suspended at the moment, but in 2021 we're hosting Mandy Nash, Emily Notman, Liz Clay and Anne Kelly. Um, we also have uh, collaborative study visits and we're working at the moment because there's two sides to us really. There's the artist side where we make things with textile stitch and felt or, or with, with felted pictures or uh, we also make um, stitched and uh, botanical prints and things like that. And we also have some members who actually focus on silk painting, silk paper making, uh, machine embroidery, if you can see that. That's by a maker called Pat Ferns. Um, silk painting and so on. So we've got a range of different textiles that are represented, textile uh, methods. Um, and we also, and we were, at the moment, we're working towards um, a stay at home exhibition, which is going to be held in Birdwood House, Totnes in November in 2020. Um, I'm hoping that that will be able to take place actually. Um, we're actually sorry not to be able to see everybody at Bovey this year. Normally we take a materials and making stand so that we can collaborate together and exhibit and sell together. Um, otherwise we wouldn't have a chance to actually show off all that we do. Um, we also run an arts award um, qualification so that young people can get involved in textiles, which is a portfolio based qualification. And that's also to be found um, on uh, our Facebook page. Um, we can have links. We've got a Facebook page, especially for the arts award, if, you're, if uh, any young people are interested in looking at that. Um, <clears throat> what are we inspired by? Well, all sorts of things, really. Mm -hmm. Um, we make use of recycled materials, really, to try and safeguard the environment. So, so these, these are Nuno felted scarves here, which I've made. And these are, uh, this one's based, based on uh, a gathered style, which is based on um, uh, upcycled sari silk with merino wool. So there's the inside there. And this one's a circular scarf using um, fine silk. Um, we uh, produce and uh, sell sari silk so that people can make at home. Um, we have packs so that anybody who wants to have a go can have a go with, with the silk and also merino wool within it. Um, and then also scarf lengths that we sell of sari silk. We also do lots of hand dyeing for our work. So, so these are all naturally dyed, eco dyed, um, and uh, this is acid dyed wool. So we we sort of start with the process with the raw materials from scratch, and then work through to make a final product. Um, that's a silk scarf length here that I've dyed with slows. You can see that. That's a nice blush with the pink colour. You also get nice, uh, that sort of pink with avocados as well. Avocado stones. Um, on the surface, we can embellish. So we have, um, these are uh, little curls, wood, uh, curls to embellish the surface of our work. And that's both, this is with nettle and that's with madder. Um, and also we do some indigo dyeing workshops. And I've dyed that piece ready with shibori, ready to actually use it as, as a center piece for the middle piece of a scarf. So that's that piece. Um, and we can embellish on the surface. So some of us work were mainly with colour and pattern. So it's all laid out onto um, either just 
just the merino wool to start with in layers and then embellished on the surface. And then you have to go through a process of wetting it out because there are wet felters here. Um, and so we wet that out and, uh, and then we have to work it into the felt. My sister's a potter and so I, got, I commissioned her to make um, some palm wash boards um, and uh, you put this net over the surface of your fibres, wet it out with soap solution and then rub and rub and rub and then we have the uh, rolling stage. So you start off with a large roller and that's to make the um, fibres open up and then roll and roll and roll in different directions. It's almost like you have to remember the uh, compass points really. So you keep turning it so that you've got through 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees and gradually get into a smaller and smaller roller um, and so that that encourages the uh, fibres of the wool to come through the fabric if, when we're making new no felt. And uh, you can make lots and lots of different designs and each felter actually will, or Nuno Felter, will create lots of their own um, designs working with colour, texture, pattern, uh, through stitching, printing. Um, this has been, I don't know if you can see, you can't see this very well, but um, printing as well onto the surface of the fabric. Um, that's been created. So we, we are creating fabric from scratch really, or well, we'll use some uh, material if we do new no felting, but also actual felting, we will just make it from the fleece. So, so we'd have, so, so we have merino fleece, which is laid out. And then it's maybe embossed on top with silks, etc., or with mixes of silks and so on. All onto the fabric if we're making new no felt. So um, what else do I want to show you? Yeah. There's so many different possibilities that you can do. Um, here's a an environment, uh, a leaf-based uh, uh, pattern which has been mm -hmm. made with. Uh, pre, what's made called pre-felt so to cut out to make the patterns and then applied and then rolled within the, the uh, process. Um, this one's with a different kind of silk called uh, Mawata silk hankies which you um, have been hand dyed and then uh, applied. The weaver actually and so this piece has uh, been woven first and then made into a winter silk scarf um, with the, uh, the wool behind and again it's been embellished with silk to create these kind of patterns there uh, can you see those um, also um, pick up the pattern and colour of the actual fabric itself. So this is a circular scarf here which has been um, put together and then its pattern has been picked up on the other side so that you've got a, a reversible piece in the end. So um, that's quite interesting. Um, so it's really the potential of the materials which we're thinking of, trans we translate into whatever um, design pattern that we have and also things to do with what we pick up from the landscape. Jewelry, so I've got my own little uh, jewel necklace made with turquoise and uh, felt beads here. And also, sorry, my phone's going. <laughs> I can't stop that, it comes every day. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a rolled felted uh, necklet. So uh, that's, those are quite dramatic when you wear those. Um, you can see all our work on our website, which is, uh, uh, sorry, not our website, our Facebook page, um, which is called Creative Southwest. 
and uh, there you'll also find links if you want to start making things at home or need some more supplies because we have all those including the palm washboards as well available so um, no really it's uh, lovely to be able to work with others and, uh, so uh, it's, that's that's what we do so that's we're creative southwest that was fantastic Fantastic. Thanks very much, Carolyn. And I, and I think it really, you kind of really demonstrated perfectly how actually the materials and the processes themselves can be a starting point for inspiration and actually that the knowledge of those methods and materials can really um, be translated and be, um, sorry, I'm losing my words, can actually influence, hugely influence the, the outcomes and the objects that you create. Also some really lovely examples there of um, kind of working across textile disciplines as well in terms of printing. Um, well every piece is actually unique and we have lots of different starting points and each, each um, if, if you're a felter or a new no felter actually you find that you've got you, you develop your own style just like as a potter or, or and so on or a jewellery maker um, and each person tends to work in a different way and, and even the process is slightly different for each person and you pick up the, the way that you actually want to work. So absolutely. Does anyone have any questions for Carolyn? Just me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was really great. I mean, I think we've kind of pulled out some interesting themes. We've kind of picked up on the identity and heritage one, which um, Laura, you did, you know, you kind of, the leech pottery itself is um, yeah. a place of, of really kind of passing on of, of traditions. And, and I think a lot of what we do is about that kind of taking our hands and working with people who know how to do it already, who teach us, um, and then all of us develop that and move it on in, in different ways. So even, you know, we've got two potters in the room here, but the work that's created is hugely different because of yeah. the, how, what your point of inspiration is um, and what materials you work with and then the objects that you create out of the other end. And everything that you guys have made is all kind of really deeply personal to you, but actually is also telling stories that are universal to all of us. and will in some way connect with, hopefully connect with the people who are watching this today, um, connect with the people who want to buy your work and take it into their own homes and be able to continue to tell its story. So that's been amazing. Um, is there anything that any of you want to talk about, ask about, say before we wrap up? Well, I'd just like to say it's a pity that uh, the Craft Festival and the Cheltenham Craft Festival can't take place this year and we look forward to seeing you all in 2021. <laughs> Indeed, but also wonderful that we've been able to create this digital craft festival in yeah, the meantime. Indeed. So in a world where we can't actually meet in person just now, we're still able to spend time in, in digital rooms talking and sharing our experience and uh, then putting that out into the world and hopefully maybe engage with people who wouldn't otherwise have been able to turn up in person at these events. So, so that's fab too. Excellent. Well, on that note, I would like to say a huge thank you to all of you guys for taking part in this Digital Craft Festival show and tell and a huge thank you to everyone who has um, watched and listened. Go and check out the website and check out the places where you can find all of the wonderful makers that we've got today and I'm sure if you've got any questions they would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much.